Well, good morning, everyone. We are so excited to be having Bible study. We typically teach a Thursday morning Bible study um, right in the spot where I live, but today we are not only having our Bible study group join us online, but uh, we're also pushing this out so many more friends can join us. So good morning, good morning. I'm really excited to um, have everyone on this Bible study for this early Thursday morning. I know those of you on the East Coast, it's early, but those of you in other time zones, it's really, really early. And for those of you on the West Coast, it's really, really, really early. So um, welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Turkhurst with Proverbs 31 Ministries, and I have the distinct honor and privilege to have Joel Mudamale, who is not only a dear friend, he works on my team at Proverbs 31 Ministries. He's the Director of Theological Research. He is uh, just the most amazing person in my estimation to study the Bible with. So Joel, it's quite an honor to have you. Do you wanna give everyone all the letters that come after your name? Oh or gosh. Yeah, um, thanks, Lise. I'm uh, so honored to, to be here with y'all. So I, my background, I did undergrad in biblical studies and theology. I ended up church planting in California. Uh, I always thought I'd be bivocational in ministry. So I got a secondary degree, a master's in organizational psychology. Um, and then I just felt the Lord was like, my passion is theology. Like I love studying the Bible. So I went back, I did an MDiv, a THM, uh, which are two different degrees. It's not a big deal. And then um, I am a PhD candidate right now. So I start writing my dissertation just in a couple months. And uh, hopefully this time next year, I will have defended my dissertation. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. So all that to really say, I love God's word. And I just uh, love digging into it. Uh, and even more than teaching God's word, I love when um, I can teach other people how to unpack the brilliance and the beauty inside of scripture. Thank you, Joel. And today our topic, of course, is in times what every Christian needs to know. I want to mention a couple of things as we get started. You're definitely going to want a pad of paper and a pen. So if you don't have that, go ahead and get that. I also want to point out Joel and my team and I, we have worked on a resource. Uh, one of my gals, Kimberly, is going to give you a link uh, right below. And it's a printable resource. It's a little bit like a Cliff Notes version, if you will, of what we're going to be talking about called End Times What Every Christian Needs to Know. If you want to go ahead and print that off, great. If you want to wait till the end and print it off, that's helpful too. Um, I wanted you to be able to have some of the words we're going to be saying today are a little cumbersome and not as familiar as everyday language words. So I wanted you to be able to have a resource so that anything you miss that we speak verbally, number one, you will have that at your fingertips on this resource. But also number two, you'll know how to spell some of these words. Because if you were to look at my notes right now, I guarantee you I have some misspelled words. But on our resource, hopefully... Um, that'll be a terrific help and guide for you. So again, if you miss something, don't fret, don't panic. We're going to have this guide for you in times when every Christian needs to know. It's in the links right below. Um, Joel, will you kick us off with a prayer and then we'll jump right into the teaching? Yeah, Lord, um, God, we're just so thankful that in this moment, um, you are ruling, that you are reigning, that you are king. Um, Lord, that you are sovereign, which means that you have authority over all things. Uh, everything is underneath you and you hold all things together uh, through your son, Jesus, and by the Spirit. Um, and Lord, I just pray that your Spirit would give us clarity as we unpack your word. Um, God, you're, you've given us your word as a gracious gift. Um, and so we just pray for humility as we approach the scriptures. Uh, God, knowing that uh, we just don't know um, all the nuances and the details, and yet you still make the scripture so approachable for us, and that in itself is a miracle and a grace, and we thank you for that. So, Lord, I just pray that at the end of our time studying your word together, that we would leave with affections that are stirred up so strongly uh, for your son, Jesus, and that we would have deep within our hearts an assurance um, of your goodness and of your faithfulness. We trust you, we love you, uh, and we put all of our faith and hope and trust in you. In your name we pray, amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Joel. So where did this teaching even come from? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my youngest daughter, Brooke, popped into the kitchen and said, Mom, uh, can you give me Joel's phone number? Uh, my friends and I want to get on a call with him to talk about end times. And uh, I knew where her questions were coming from because in the middle of this worldwide pandemic um, and also other things happening, I know in our area, in addition to COVID-19, right when this whole thing started, an animal got into the water supply of my county. And so while everyone else in the world was being told, wash your hands, wash your hands, uh, in our county, it was like, except if you live in Union County, don't use the water. So it felt very odd, very strange. Also, just this past weekend, we had terrifically like loud and crazy storms. And, and then I know that there was a lot of um, weather activity in other parts of the country. I know I was talking to someone from Georgia yesterday and um, they had in their town complete devastation from the storms and even some deaths. And then, you know, we turn on the news and there's economic meltdown. And this is the first time in my lifetime that I, that I can think about how this isn't just located in some parts of the world, but this is truly a collective experience throughout the world, this COVID-19. And there feels like there's so much unknown. So I knew my daughter and her friends were talking about end times because it seems logical for people to ask the question, are we in the end times? The purpose of our conversation today isn't to make a strong case whether COVID-19 is part of end times, not part of end times. Uh, we definitely don't want to get into, is this the judgment of God, the mercy of God? I think those conversations are fine, but that's not the conversation we're going to have today. The conversation we're going to have today is taking a look at the biblical framework for what does the Bible say about end times? What does the Bible say about this word called eschatology? And eschatology means the study of end times. It, it, today we want to give you what the Bible says, not using our opinion to make a strong case as to which eschatological, how do you say that word, Joel? Yeah, you told it. I did. Yeah. Yes, thank you. There you go. Not, not making a strong case using our opinion as to which camp you belong to, but really providing you with the scriptures that each of the different theological lines of thought when it comes to eschatology, which one, you know, you, you need to have the scriptural framework for each camp or each uh, type of thought so that you yourself can get into God's word, know where to turn. And so as you're having these conversations, you can be prepared. So I gave you the word eschatology, that's end times, but I also want to give you another word that Joel just gave me, and it's called protology. And maybe this is the first time you're hearing that word, but I think it's important where eschatology is the study of end times, protology is the study of first things. And if anyone knows me, certainly those of you who have joined me in Thursday morning Bible studies that we usually do at my daughter's house, um, and you know that I often will go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I do think it's very important to understand that our protology, the way we look at the way things first happened in creation, and that word protos in the Greek means first, logos means the study of the word. So the first mention or the study of first things in God's word is protology, but our protology is absolutely going to inform our eschatology. So when we go back to Genesis chapter one, which gives us a macro overview of creation, then we go to Genesis two, which gives us a more micro view of creation. We see certain things. We see a garden. We see Adam and Eve made in the image of God, made to rule and subdue the earth. They were to be guardians. And Joel, I'd love for you to comment just a little bit about how even in Genesis, we see such a picture that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies, almost referencing like the temple and that Adam and Eve were supposed to guard this 
section of the Garden of Eden called the Holy of Holies. And so just talk about that for a second and then we'll keep going. That's so good, Lee. So one of the things that's super important that we want to see are the first pictures, the first images uh, that we find in scripture. And so uh, one of my favorite theologians is a guy named N.T. Wright. Um, and N.T. Wright asks this question often, and, and I just love what he says. He says, what is God up to? We want to ask that question. What is God up to? And in the opening pages of Genesis, we wonder, what is God up to? Well, God creates Eden um, as a temple garden. God is the first gardener. He creates the first garden city. And it's interesting, the dynamics of the garden city. One, you have this as a place, a garden, where God himself um, is interacting with. Uh, the opening pages of Genesis tell us that Adam and Eve, they walk and they talk with God. So just keep that in mind, put it in the back of your mind. The presence of God and the people of God are together in this garden city. The second thing we have are that Adam and Eve are a type of high priest and king. Uh, Joel, what does that mean? Well, in Genesis 2.15, the Hebrew word that's used um, when God tells Adam and Eve to keep the garden, to, to keep it, it's the Hebrew word samar. And this is the exact same word that's used and can be translated as to guard or protect. In fact, this is the same word that's used of the Levitical uh, priesthood, the priests who were to guard the temple, particularly the Holy of Holies. It's the exact same word that's used to describe um, the, the watchers on the watchtower as they're watching to make sure enemies don't come in. So this is unbelievable. Instantly, right in the beginning, we have the Garden of Eden as a type of temple. We have Adam and Eve as a type of high priest and, and king, uh, kingly role. They're walking and talking with God, which is ultimately the Holy of Holies. Uh, and so in the very beginning, we have all of this imagery of a temple city, God as king, and God appointing Adam and Eve as his vice regents, just a big word to say, his, his appointed ambassadors to spread the glory of God out to the ends of the earth. So another important thought, uh, Adam and Eve were never supposed to stay put and be build up walls, right? And to be safeguarded. No, they were actually supposed to start in Eden and then work themselves out into the ends of the earth, ultimately to manifest the glory of God out to the ends of the earth. And we think about that. And then we think about the Great Commission and we think, huh, what is God up to? Well, God doesn't initiate brand new things often. In fact, he is setting the railroad track back in its right orientation, in its right direction. So by the time we get to the very end of the Bible, in Revelation 21 and 22, we see this picture of a return back to Eden. So that's why it's important to combine first times with end times, because this isn't just a straight linear story. It is going to be a story that circles back to the original design in the Garden of Eden. So I think it's important before we get into uh, end times that we take a couple of looks at, at the first time. So what, it, what was the Garden of Eden like for Adam and Eve? So there was a physical reality in the Garden and uh, for Adam and Eve. And that physical reality was that their bodies were in a state of perfection. And uh, they were walking, they were eating, they were talking, they were together. What was the relationship like? What was their emotional state? So we've got their physical state, but what was their emotional state? I think we see uh, the best picture of their emotional state in Genesis 2.25. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So this gives us this picture of their emotional reality was they could freely walk in vulnerability, physically and emotionally, and feel nothing but the pure love of God. What this verse is really getting at is they had no other thoughts in their mind that they would filter through. They had no other opinion opinions to contend with, except the absolute love of God himself, a state where it didn't emotionally mess with them to be that vulnerable. They emotionally had no shame. They had no competing thoughts except love and perfection. And then what was their spiritual state? Their spiritual state is they were without sin. So I think those things are good to keep in mind. 
because I think sometimes, and, and if you were really honest, and I know in Thursday morning Bible study, for those of you who've been with us before, you you understand this, uh, sometimes this resistance to heaven. Now, I want to handle this carefully because most of us don't talk about our resistance to heaven, but I had everyone in my Thursday morning Bible study give me some of their fears of heaven. And some of the fears of heaven were, we're going to be uh, like angel beings floating around uh, wearing little white drapey things. And we're just going to be singing praise songs all the time. And in some of the more honest comments that I got, they said, we know we're supposed to look forward to this, but this is complicated because even when praise and worship goes too long at church, I start to get antsy. So if I feel like I'm going to be nothing but this spiritual being floating in the clouds, playing a harp, singing worship music. I'm not sure I want to do that for all of eternity. But when we go to the Garden of Eden, we see such a picture of Adam and Eve were enjoying their life. They had the perfect presence of God, the provision of God, the protection of God. And so I just think that this is a beautiful picture. Now, things don't stay like they were in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 3, the serpent gets into the Garden of Eden. And like, Joel, you may want to make a comment about this. Adam and Eve were supposed to be guarding this place. Yeah. So the serpent coming in was the first indication that Adam and Eve let something into the garden that wasn't supposed to be in the garden, right? Yeah, I, I call this dereliction of duty. <laughs> Um, Adam and Eve had a responsibility. And I think that's an indication, we're gonna to get to end times, but again, the picture that, that Lisa has just pointed out of the first times are of humanity, Adam and Eve, made in the likeness and image of God. They're equal in value and worth together. They are both a type of high priest and a type of high king. Um, and they are both supposed to protect the garden. They have a purpose. God has intention for them to be doing something. Um, and we know what so they're they not just spiritual beings floating around playing a harp. Right. They are carrying with them in their purpose, the glory of God, the evidence that they are uh, creatures made in the image of God to proclaim the goodness and the glory of God. Their, their very life is not just them singing worship songs all the time, which is wonderful. But it's not just worshiping with song. It's worshiping with their their whole being. Yeah, I mean, Paul talks about this, and he says uh, in the New Testament, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Well, that word worthy comes from this idea of worth and worship coming together. Um, and so we see this uh, particularly. Now, the question is, how in the world does a serpent get into the garden city? Uh, we're wondering these things. One of the important things that we have to understand is that the Israelites, they live in a time called, it, it's the a &E, the ancient Near East. Um, and for them, they would have had this idea of the garden city sitting on a mountaintop. Now, we're going to think of a lot of different Psalms that describe Mount Zion and the city that's on Mount Zion. So you're seeing some of this come to play. Um, and then this is really important. Maybe one day we'll do another uh, one of these teaching series. We did this in our Bible study on spiritual beings, but there is this indication that uh, there are these heavenly spiritual beings that are coming to and fro uh, in the Garden City. They're interacting with humanity, but we know that the fall took place with Lucifer. So Adam and Eve have a responsibility to ensure that the Garden City they've been given as a gift, that they protect it. And by simply the allowance of the serpent, this is what I think some other Old Testament theolo uh, theologians would agree, that um, the, the evidence of the serpent creeping itself into the Garden City is actually the very first evidence of a bit of dereliction of duty, that Adam and Eve um, were supposed to do something and then they didn't. And so the, this thing about Eve now, when she sees the serpent, the first thing is, you're not supposed to be here. This is not the right place for you. Uh, and so that's what we have going on. Okay. And so we don't want to stay here in Genesis too long, but I want to show you one other thing. When we get to Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve now eat the fruit that was forbidden for them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when that happens, there are consequences. And so those consequences are given, and now sin has entered in. 
So Adam and Eve, now their bodies are in a state of, you know, God said, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. Well, the death wasn't immediate, but it was eventual. That now their physical bodies were no longer in a state of perfection. They were in essence starting that process of heading toward a physical death. And in that tree, or in the Garden of Eden, there is also the tree of life. To eat from the tree of life would have meant to perpetuate you in, in an eternal state. So it wasn't an act of cruelty that God made them leave the garden. It was an, actually an act of great mercy. God said, you have to leave the garden of Eden. I cannot allow you to stay here because then, then you might eat from the tree of life, which before sin was okay, but now after sin is not. So at the end of Genesis 3, we see God sending them out. And that's what the ESV says, is that God sent them out. I know NIV says that he banishes them. But again, this wasn't an act of cruelty. It was an act of mercy saying, you must go out now. And I'm going to give you a gift. Mm. It's not going to feel like a gift. But I'm going to give you the gift that your physical body will die. But I have a plan. And I will send Jesus Christ, my one and only son, and his, through his death and resurrection, you will be given an opportunity to then be resurrected, if you will, not in your physical body. You will trade your physical body for an eventual heavenly body. And so all of this is coming into play when we talk about end times. We also have to talk about first time. So it's protology and eschatology. So one other, I want to give you a couple of the scripture references for anybody who's had this feeling like, okay, I know we're talking about end times. That means Jesus is coming back, but I don't want Jesus to come back until I get married. I don't want Jesus to come back until I have kids. I don't want Jesus to come back until I finish raising my kids. I don't want Jesus to come back until my friend is saved or my mom is saved or my my uh, certain things happen in my life. I, I understand those sentiments. I think if we're honest, while we simultaneously look forward to the return of Christ, sometimes in my harder moments of life, I'm even begging, please let this be the day that you return. So all this chaos on earth is done with, right? But I also understand the questions of, but I don't want Jesus to return until so let me just give one other, two other scripture references. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. You'll see that life on earth is compared to a fight, a race, and a trial. But eternity is compared to a reward. So once we get to heaven, we're not going to want to come back to the fight, the race, and the trial. You're not going to be disappointed when Jesus returns. Or when you pass away, if you pass away before Jesus returns and you get to heaven, you're, you're not going to be disappointed. Another scripture I want to show you is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 42 through 44. The natural body in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, the natural body is perishable, breakable, or the word that's used there is dishonor, like it will get sick, it will have issues you can break your leg, break your arm, you know, you can get certain diseases, COVID-19, you know, all of those things that the natural body is susceptible to diseases and to problems. So it's perishable. There's the word dishonor and it's weakness. Our spiritual body, what we will then get in eternity, look at the words that 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44 describe our spiritual body, imperishable, glory, and power. In other words, I just want to settle our emotions down and to say, if Jesus were to return today, and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will not be disappointed. If you were to pass away today, and if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you get the first glimpses of eternity, you're not going to be disappointed. Joel and I don't want to fill in the gaps with our opinion of what will this be like and what will that be like. We just want to go straight to scripture and now look at the different ways that people define eschatology, the end time. So Joel, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can give us the framework. First, Joel, will you give us the framework 
of the three distinct camps that we're going to be talking about. And then go right into yeah. your and um, so teaching. This, first, I want to start with this. Um, the way we want to approach uh, not just this topic, but scripture in general, this is a deep heart conviction of mine, is with a sense of humility. Uh, we want to do theology. I want my theology, when I do theology, I want it to be done in the most humble way because uh, I want to position myself underneath the text, looking up and recognizing um, the, the majesty, the, the, the gravity of God's word. Uh, and I think this will help us in being charitable with each other. So you're probably on Facebook right now and you're probably, there's a little, might be a little bit of stress because you're thinking, oh my gosh, what if Joel says something that I don't agree with or I was taught this my whole life and now I'm being posed. Well, I just want to suggest that's a good thing because we're seeing a full picture of the greatness of God. I had a Bible college uh, professor once who said, Joel, you know, um, one of the greatest things that would happen for the church is if we went to Africa, and when we went to Africa, we saw um, the people in Africa worshiping. Like, their worship is unbelievable. The, the beats and the drums, and, and it gives us a glimpse of the way God created them. If we went to India uh, and watched somebody pray, the prayer time in India is unbelievable. If we went to the United States and we saw the creativity and the innovation that's taking We'd be blown away. Well, what's happening? We're seeing that the bigger our picture of God is, um, the more we realize how massive he is, and we're able to put ourselves in the right position with him. So I want to just set the stage that as we begin this conversation, um, to approach with humility and charity. Uh, and I think there are some really uh, strong points for a lot of these different positions. So we have to start in Revelation chapter 20. Um, and so if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn there. And I want to start with this one unique detail. In Revelation chapter 20, uh, actually, let's just read it. Let's read Revelation 20. We're going to read from verses 1 through 6. Uh, and then I'm going to outline the three positions. But I want to start with the text. Um, and notice it, it starts with this idea of the thousand years. Revelation 20, this is John. John, um, uh, some conversation on who John is. I think John is the um, apostle who wrote uh, the gospel. Like, I think John is the beloved disciple of Jesus. John is on exile. He's in Patmos. That's, that's uh, who I think this is. John, uh, this is what he says. Then I saw, pay attention to those phrases. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. If you like highlight in your Bibles or take notes in your journals, you probably want to just take a note of that phrase, a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ, notice this, for a thousand years. Now, verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Go ahead and highlight, underline, take note of that phrase, first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death, I want you to highlight and take note of the second death. Such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, we uh, are talking about one chapter in the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic in nature, um, arguably the hardest book to interpret in the New Testament. And let me just make things a little, little bit more interesting. The only time we see this phrase of, um, of a, a thousand year reign is in this chapter of the Bible. And so now we have to ask some questions like, wait a minute, what is the thousand years and how do we understand the thousand years? And is this literal? Is it figurative? Is there symbolism? 
And based off of how we understand the thousand years, the rest of these verses that surround it will come to light. But I want us to pay attention to just a few of those words. The, notice the first resurrection and notice the second death. Lisa actually just described the first death. The first death took place in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve partake of the fruit, it's interesting, it says that, that you will die. There's this imminence to death, but then they don't die right away. Well, what took place? Actually, then there's a spiritual death that took place. And in Adam and Eve, our forefather, uh, forefathers and mothers, like in them, we are actually taking part of that same death. So we've experienced a type of spiritual death. This is why we need Jesus. This is our desperation for Jesus. Now, let me outline these thousand years. What does this mean? Well, the Greek word thousand, um, it can be translated uh, literally. It often throughout the uh, scriptures is also translated figuratively. So we see both um, uh, positions here. Uh, and the, you, these are some words that you will have re uh, remembered or have heard in the past. Uh, first is pre-millennial. So the thousand years can be defined as a millennium. And the first position is pre or before the millennium. Um, and what this position means ultimately is that Christ is going to come back physically and bodily. Now, notice these words I'm, I'm, I'm giving us. There's a sense of literalness to the position that Christ is going to come back physically and bodily to the earth, the present age, and reign on the earth for a period of a thousand years. Now, historically, traditionally, the premillennial position is going to say the thousand years is a literal reign, right? It's going to be a, a legitimate 1,000 years. Um, now, this position can be further divided into two major camps. I'm just going to briefly touch on them. Uh, the first one is historic. So it's history, historic pre-millennialism. Um, and this is really interesting. I think this position has such strength to it. Um, the very first Christian church fathers, the early church, they held to this view. That's why it is historic pre-millennialism. Um, people like uh, Irenaeus or Papias, Justin Martyr, uh, Tertullian, uh, these different church fathers that we read about, they all would have held to this view. Now, what is it? This view believes that there's this thousand-year reign, but pre-millennial, before the thousand-year reign takes place, Jesus is going to bodily come back to earth, um, and he is going to uh, reign and rule. Typically, this means that when he comes back, the people of God will have experienced a type of great tribulation. Um, things have gotten bad. They've experienced a tribulation. Uh, and so when Jesus comes back, he is going to right all the wrongs and he's going to reign for a literal thousand years. When he reigns, so this is some of the nuances of the premillennial position, the historic uh, premillennial position. They would also suggest that during this thousand year reign, there could be some people who don't believe in that Jesus is the actual Messiah. Uh, there could be some people that are still unregenerate during this time period, but Jesus is in total control, right? He is totally um, in power and authority. At the end of this literal thousand year reign, the serpent is released. We read a little bit about that. Um, the serpent is released. There's going to be one final battle, the battle of Armageddon. And then it's, over. Jesus is going to conquer everything, and it's all good. Now, some of you are wondering, Joel, this sounds really interesting, but I thought I heard about this thing called the rapture. Like, it seems really interesting. Well, the rapture is a focal point in the second major camp, and this is called dispensational, dispensational premillennialism. And this position is going to say, well, uh, actually, there, there might be seem to be indication in scripture that Jesus, God, God himself, he's going to protect his elect. He's going to protect his church from the coming great tribulation. And so what's going to happen is he's going to actually come and he's going to take, he's going to rescue the uh, people who are allowed to believe in Jesus and take them away from the earth, right? So Pay attention to this language. The idea is that you're going away from the earth. They're going to take them away from the earth. And there's going to be a time of great tribulation. 
Um, it's going to be, uh, some people say three and a half years, some people might say seven years, depends on how you translate some of this. Uh, ultimately, there's going to be a time of great tribulation. Uh, at the end of that tribulation period, Jesus is going to come back, and then he's going to reign and rule for a thousand years. The other distinction about this position is that there is a place for ethnic Israel, so dispensational, that you have the church age that takes place after the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and then you also have uh, the Israelites, the, ancient, the, the, the people of God in the Old, Old Testament. Dispensational premillennialism would say, actually, there's a role for both ethnic Israel and for the church. This is a, a really interesting, really important aspect of this position. Um, and, and so uh, we have kind of this idea, a, a couple strong just uh, aspects of premillennialism in general, right? I'm, I'm not talking specifically about one camp or the other, just taking a step back and talking in general. One is in Revelation 20, uh, John sees the angel who's thrown into the abyss. We saw this. One of the benefits or the, the strong points of this position is they say, well, Joel, in Revelation uh, 17, 18, and 19, it seems like there's a sequence of events. The seventh trumpet goes um, on Revelation 19. Jesus defeats the enemy. Revelation 20, the enemy is defeated in the abyss. And if you look at Revelation chapter 12, there's also the story of this woman and the dragon. And the woman, the dragon, uh, the dragon's chasing her. And then um, the uh, dragon is defeated and cast down. So it seems like that's a separate instance. Revelation 12 is separate. Then you have Jesus victorious, Revelation 19. And then you have Revelation 20, which we see another battle take place. Um, but this is the casting down of the serpent. The dragon is named in Revelation 20. So it seems like these are a sequence of events. That's a really strong position for the pre-millennial uh, uh, kind of uh, spot. And so the idea is that right now, Revelation 12 points to the time that we live in that Satan was cast to earth and he wields a limited amount of power. But in Revelation 20, if you're reading this and you're reading it literally, it seems that when the serpent is cast into the abyss, he's sealed and now he has no power or authority. So that, that poses some problems for some of the other positions, but we'll get to it in a bit. And the other very strong, I, I, this, I think this is the strongest uh, part, is remember I said the resurrection. Um, in Revelation 20, verse 5, 5b, the very uh, last half, uh, John says this is the first resurrection. Uh, that word resurrection is uh, anastasis. Uh, anastasis. Uh, anastasis is a, an important word for us because, in fact, N.T. Wright wrote a book called Jesus uh, and the, Re the Resurrection of the Son of God. Um, and in it, he argues that this Greek word, is every, like, I think it's like 41 times it's used. I'm, I'm thinking it's 41 times it's used in the Bible. Of the 41 times, like 39 of them, it's always referring to a physical resurrection. Well, now we're saying, oh, the literal interpretation, it seems to lend to that. So in Revelation 20, verse 5, it says, this is the first resurrection. It seems like there is a bodily resurrection that's taking place. Um, and there's some unique things, and I'm just going to tease out the challenge. I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to. I'm going to tease out the challenge. Notice that the word before resurrection is first. And we just talked about that, protology, study of first things. So we have protos, anastasis. We have the first resurrection. This combination of two words is used nowhere else in the Bible either. So again, a very interesting thing. We have a word that's used all the time, always referring to physical resurrection, but in Revelation 20, John uses a combination of the word that's totally unique, not used elsewhere. Um, and so this is, the, the resurrection as being physical is a strong point for the pre-millennial position. Now, let me give a couple challenges, uh, things to consider about this position. Uh, the first one is, well, what does the Bible actually teach about the rapture? This is particular for the dispensational position. The idea of the rapture seems to indicate that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to take his people, rescue them from a great tribulation, but rescue them where? Take them away from the earth to another place, 
allow the tribulation to take place, but then Jesus is going to come back. So it seems like there's a second, there's a third actual by now, right? Because we've got Jesus in the incarnation, that's his first return. Then we have Jesus who comes as the rapture, that's the second return. And this position seems to indicate, well, there's a third return. After Jesus raptures his people away, he's going to actually come back a third time. And that's the final time that he's going to come back. Well, the challenge here is we don't seem to find indication of a third uh, return. So we have to figure out how to answer that question. Here's the other really interesting one. The Old Testament passages that are used to defend the premillennial position. Um, Isaiah 60, Ezekiel 40 and 48. Um, they are not mentioned or alluded to at all in Revelation 20. Uh, Revelation 20. They're not mentioned or alluded to at all, but they're all over the place in Revelation 21 and 22. But Revelation 21 and 22 is talking about the new heavens and the new earth. So if we have a literal interpretation of the millennium, this is a consideration for this position we have to think about. And in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, there seems to be a rebuilding of a physical temple. Um, but in the millennium, we would imagine that that would be in Revelation 20, but it's not. And so all the allusions to those texts are in Revelation 21 and 22. But in 21 and 22, we're talking about the new heavens and new earth. And in fact, in Revelation uh, 21, verse 22, John says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So this is something that has to be just kind of considered and, uh, and addressed. And um, uh, here's, here's probably the, the last one. Uh, that we will look at for uh, the premillennial uh, position is we talked about the resurrection and we talked about um, the people. Here's the other question that we have to think. This is more uh, a philosophical question is, could it actually be possible that the reigning ruling king of the universe comes back and literally reigns for a thousand years and yet there are still unrepentant, unregenerate people? It's a question we have to ask. How, how does that work? Um, but uh, a lot of strong, strong points. The first church fathers all held to a historic pre-millennial position. Lisa, any thoughts, comments based off of that? That was a lot. That's like a fire, fire, is the, what's the phrase? Fire hose hydrant? Yes. So let's just break down the basics. Just so as we're walking away, that was a lot of information and you can take it as deep as you want to, those who are listening to this, but here are the basics. If you are in the pre-millennial camp and Joel, correct me if I'm wrong, yep. you can either be historic pre-millennial or most of the time you'll hear people talking about dispensationalism or dispensational premillennium. So it's the same camp, it's just historic or dispensational. Mm -hmm. But if you are in that camp, you believe in the rapture. Uh, if you're in the dispensational if camp. If you're in the dispensational premillennial camp, okay? So think about the Left Behind series that I know many of you have read the books and you've seen the movies. And so if you're, if you're listening to that and you have this thought that, oh, in, and I believe you're probably going to get to the verses in Matthews where two, or in Matthew, where two people are in a field and suddenly one is taken away and one is still there. So this idea is that the, the, in this dispensational premillennial camp, the one who is taken away is the Christian. Yeah, saved who the saved persons who Jesus comes and takes away and poof, they're gone. Clothes are just laying in a field or two women are grinding wheat. I think is the other example we'll get to. And one is still there and the other poof, their clothes are there, but they have been removed. And I think if you saw those movies, this is the camp, this dispensational pre-millennial camp. This is the camp of the left behind movies. Yeah. Okay. So that's just kind of that, that to me helps to give my brain some modern day context to what is happening here. And basically it's that God will protect the elect from the tribulation. So there is a rapture, the, the saved are taken away. There's three and a half or seven years of tribulation. Then 
Jesus comes back for a thousand years to rule and reign. There's a major role of ethnic, ethnic Israel and the church in this uh, thousand year reign. Yeah. Okay. Nailed. Okay, perfect. So that's that. All right. So now that's camp number one. So let's set that aside. Now let's go on to camp number so two. Camp number two is a phrase called, it's a term called post millennium. Uh, this is a little bit of an, an, an irony. I just want to point this out. Notice that we've, we've now titled all these three major camps around one word, uh, one phrase that's used one time in the hardest book of the I just think there's a little bit of humor in that as well. Okay, this is called post millennium. And, and you'll probably already have an idea just off of the title. You have the millennium, but we have this idea of Jesus returning and ruling and reigning after the millennium. That's where the post comes in. So Christ will come and reign. The post-millennium position will typically talk about this phrase called the golden age. Um, you'll hear about that. Uh, Christ will come and reign after a golden age or the thousand years. Uh, the majority, I want to say the majority of post-millennial kind of position will not hold to a literal thousand years. They're going to say this is a symbolic uh, word. And they're going to have some things in common with the third camp that we're going to talk about. And they're going to say, well, Joel, um, it, it makes sense because a thousand years uh, is used often in the Old Testament as imagery. Um, a cattle on a thousand years, uh, one day in your courts is like a thousand years. I mean, we've got all, we could go on and on and on about the thousand years. So is it taken literally there? No, it's taken symbolically. So there seems to be some definition there for why this could be. And Joel, I want to say one other thing about the symbolism, because especially when we're in Revelation, you know, people uh, want to know, I want to know, is are, like what we're reading here, is it really exactly, like, can, can we take this literally or is it some symbolically? Well, I just want to sidestep that just a little bit. And I want us to remember, don't strip the humanity from the text, yeah. even when we're reading Revelation. So this is the best way that I can understand maybe what's going on here with John. So John is seeing into the future, but John only has the ability to reference what he knows at the time that he's living. So think about if you lived at the time of John, Okay. And, and it, it's not a, it, it, it's not a modern world like we know now. So imagine if you lived then and you were asked to describe a cell phone or an iPad or an airplane or a rocket ship, or, uh, what are those fighter planes like F-16s or something? Yeah. Right. Is that true? I don't know. Uh, it sounds right. Sounds good. <laughs> So let's say you were asked to describe some of those things, but you could only use references to describe them that you could find in biblical times. How would you describe a rocket ship? Maybe you would describe it as a beast with fire coming out of it, right? How would you describe a cell phone that it was like a ghost or like an angel in a square box that had you know, like imagine trying to describe a Zoom call. Well, it's a, it's like an angel that has light coming out, but it has 16 heads because you see right. all these different squares of people right. on this Zoom call, right? And so I just want us to remember as we're even sticking our toes into Revelation here that this John only had access to describe using his point of reference at the time. So is it literal? Is it symbolic? Or do we just put the humanity in the text and say, John is doing his very best to describe what he sees, but he only has the reference of what he can use to describe what he sees based on the time in history that he lived. Okay, so now keep going. No, that's super important. And what you're talking about, Lisa, is the uh, term hermeneutics. How do we study the Bible? And the way we study the Bible, we determine meaning based off of the genre and the historical, social, and cultural context. So a couple of quick people. Kevin Van Hooser is a brilliant theologian. He has a book called uh, Is There Meaning in the Text? And it's a great book that gives you a hermeneutics. And one of my professors right now, Andreas Kostenberger, has a book called um, uh, Interpretive Methods, I think, I think it's called. Uh, it's brilliant. It kind of unpacks some of this. Uh, but to your point, 
how do we think about these terms? Well, the post-millennial position is going to say it's most natural to take the symbolism for symbolism. When it talks about the lampstand, we're not thinking there's a literal lampstand. We actually see no in the Old Testament, a lampstand was used in the temple to give light to the entire place. So for the churches to be symbolized as a lampstand is to say, oh, the church is a type of agent used by God to shed light in the darkness. So those are the types of, uh, of imagery and illustrations that are taking place. Um, the post-millennial position, they're going to believe that the millennium typically is figurative, and it starts, the, the starting point of the millennium is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So the millennium has started in that sense. Uh, there's some nuances. Uh, we'll talk about this in our next installment of this, AD 70. In AD 70, the temple is destroyed. And so uh, some post-millennialists, uh, uh, Doug Wilson, who's a brilliant theologian, they would say, well, there is this overlap. If you had a Venn diagram, you kind of know that, right? The Venn diagram. And there's this middle part where there's an overlapping of the things. So you have the, uh, the millennium starting at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But the old age, the, the old covenant age, it doesn't end until AD 70. So you have a, you know, a hundred year period with Paul is still around and some of these early, you know, that they're in kind of both places. It, it is important for them later on. But uh, so they view that in that sense. And here's the biggest thing about this position. They believe that in this time period, that the gospel is advancing. And as the gospel goes out into the end of the earth, uh, the world is getting better. The world is getting better. Uh, they're going to say uh, humanity is going to get better, that as we win more people for Christ, that culture and society and economics and um, all of these things have to get better because the risen king is now impacting all. Now, I just want to say one of the things I love about this position Man, that's so hopeful. <laughs> I want that. I want things to get better. That is so hopeful. Um, and here are the other, here are the other things. Um, the people that held to this view, people like the Puritans held, held to this view. Um, people like uh, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield. And here's the biggest one. One of my great, my favorite uh, uh, Puritan, I guess, um, theologians is a guy named Jonathan Edwards. I say affections all the time because Jonathan Edwards wrote a book called Religious Affections. Jonathan Edwards held to a post-millennial view. Um, but here, let me just share some of the challenges. Well, things seem to be getting worse, not better. In fact, it seems like the scriptures point to what uh, another professor of mine, Dr. Tom Schreiner, mentions, a time of declension. Uh, this is 2 Timothy 3.1, Matthew 24, 3-14, 2 Peter 3, 3-4. If you have the resource guide, all these uh, verses are, are laid out in that. Uh, and again, the resource guide is going to be a link right here um, in the notes portion. And, and things seem to be getting, so, so we have to, the, the position has to say, well, how do we account for that? How do we account for the fact that things, you know, uh, seem to be getting worse. Here's the other issue. Revelation. So, let me ask you a question here. So they're saying that um, that they believe that the start of the thousand years, the reign and the rule of Christ is now, but but it, they they can't possibly think it's a literal thousand years then. Exactly. That's why they're going to say it's symbolic. A thousand years is symbolic. It starts when Jesus uh, dies and, and rises again, but it's a symbolic period of time because they have to say this is the golden age. And this is the big question that we ask of, of my pre, uh, post-millennial friends. I, I would ask them, I'd be like, wait, so are we in the golden age now? Or did the, and this is what I think, this is my personal opinion. I know we're not supposed to get into the personal stuff, but I can't help myself. I think when you look at Jonathan Edwards in the time of the Puritans, things are actually getting better. Like in the sense of the gospel is advancing. Um, things like the printing press come about and we have an unprecedented time of gospel advancement. So the great, the uh, first and second great revival uh, in New England is taking place around this time. So it makes sense that they would kind of, in their immediate context, say, yeah, things seem, so, but then the question is, when is the golden age? And what has to happen in order to usher in the golden age? Here's the other challenge that I, I would see in it is sometimes this position can lend to what I call um, 
uh, moralistic behaviorism. What does that mean? It means that we have to do, <laughs> we have to continually do, there's this sense of like, like urgency, like we got to do. Now, in one sense, it's really important. Like we should have an urgency for the gospel. But there's this other sense, if it's not bridal, if it's not taken with care, that we feel like, well, the full responsibility of the return of Christ is on my shoulders. Like, I've got to advance, i got to do, i got to proclaim, my, you know? And I'll just, that, that I can feel like I've got stress right now on my shoulders. Like, I can feel the, the weight of that. So that is a, a challenge of the position of when is the golden age? And, and what do we have to actually do, accomplish in order for that to take place? Here's the, uh, the other challenge, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Um, the majority of post-millennials take this passage to mean that the gospel is proclaimed in this current age, Revelation 19, uh, 11 through 21. Now, if you look at your Bibles, 11 through 21, all you have to do is actually just look at the head heading right there. It says, my, in my Bible, it says the rider on a white horse. You're going to see right away verse 11, then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now, Here's the challenge that the post millennials have to um, have to come up with is it seems the most natural reading of this is the second coming of Jesus. It seems like it's talking about when Jesus comes to right all the wrongs, but it's so we have to do a, a lot of work. So that's the major idea. Now, I, I want to be fair to the position. I do. Um, but I think even the position themselves would, would, would have to admit this is probably today in the minority view. This is probably today the minority view. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. Lisa, okay, so just for the sake of time, I wanna, I wanna go ahead and go into the, the third view just so we can try to hit at this. And I think we'll have to do a part two, but let's go ahead and give some of the basics of the third. But just as a point of review, this second position, the post-millennial view is the minority um, Fewer people believe in, in this unpacking of scripture um, that the thousand years began at either the resurrection of Christ or 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Well, so mm -hmm. right in there. Um, and that, uh, that the world is currently in a state of getting better, not worse, yes. which for me, I know when I look at scripture, I'm not seeing that. So that's that view. But again, we're, we're, we're presenting where to go in scripture and that that is a thought. Now let's go ahead and go into this third one. And this is where we'll land today. Joel, just for the sake of landing today, let's go ahead and give the basics of this third position. Yeah. So the third position is called, uh, and I actually really dislike the, the, the title of this one, but we'll talk about it. It's called all millennial isn't now because I'm a language guy, te technically, the awe in front of the millennium is a negation. The, the technical translation is there is no millennium. Well, that's not true of the position. I like to joke and think, well, maybe the pre and post millennials hung out one day and they thought, hey, let's get the all millennial guys and just tag them with the all millennial uh, uh, position tag. So I don't think it's a fair assessment of their position. I like to use the phrase a, um, a realized millennium or an inaugurated millennium. And we'll talk about, about that. So in this position, <clears throat> millennium has already begun, but it's not yet finalized. So, so this position is gonna hold to the thousand years symbolic. In fact, it's gonna hold to its interpretive method for the book of Revelation in general, more symbolic than literal. Here's the other re the reason why. For the all millennial position, they're going to, I think more so, I'm trying to be fair, I think more so they're going to say that, that's the illustration that I have, that the book of Revelation has more allusions, echoes, and direct quotations of the Old Testament than any other book of the Bible. This is fascinating. Um, in fact, if you were to combine all of the allusions, illustrations, and echoes of the Old Testament that are used in the New Testament and Revelation, and then you took every other book of the New Testament and combined them together, I believe Revelation still wins. That is phenomenal. What's taking place? I'm a coffee guy. I love drinking coffee, but I've now switched to tea in the afternoon. At least I don't even think you know this. I've switched to tea in the afternoon because uh, the caffeine is messing with me my old age. It's, it's, it's weird. Um, and so I noticed one day, like, if I boil the hot water in my, cup of, uh, if my, in my cup and I've got my tea bag, if I drink the hot water, all I'm drinking is hot water. 
And if I try to drink a tea bag, it's very difficult. I can't drink a tea bag. I have to start chewing it and it just tastes odd, right? Like, like it, the flavor. But something spectacular takes place when I take a tea bag and I put it into the hot water. And if you watch the water, you will see the tea bag explode with flavor. You will see the water absorb all of the um, herbs and all the things that are inside of there. And then you drink the tea and you have the fragrance, the aroma, the, the, the delicious nature of that tea bag. I think what's taking place and what the amillennial position is, is going to point to is, is that the book of Revelation is like a cup of tea steeped in the Old Testament. At every corner, we're going to see Old Testament illusion. And that is one of the primary hermeneutical methods, the, the interpretive decisions, um, is because we're seeing so many of those Old Testament um, realities that take place. So in this position... They're going to believe that the thousand years is symbolic and began at the resurrection of Christ. Crucial. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. When Jesus uh, rises, he conquers sin and death. He disarms the evil one. Uh, that's an important phrase, that Jesus disarms the powers of evil. Think Ephesians 6. Paul, when he talks about the spirit of God, um, or the armor of God, sorry, he talks about the disarming of the, of the, evil, of the evil one and the powers. Jesus raises, he ascends into heaven, um, and uh, he's victorious over sin and death. So Christ right now in the amillennial position, Christ right now is reigning in the heavenly realms with the fallen faithful saints. When Jesus conquers sin and death, he brings the faithful from Hades. He goes up and he, and so now when you and I die, we have the hope of salvation. That's where Paul says, it would be better for me to die today, like to depart now because I would be with Christ now that's the belief system is in this moment when you and i die we will not go into a, a waiting place no we go to be with jesus and that's a strong point of this position um the position doesn't see a rapture uh they, they don't see a, a rapture in the same way that the dispensationalists see i i want to make a clarifying note i actually think all three positions have a rapture but they don't define it in the same way that the dispensationalist uh position just describes it they would say it's kind of like a secret rapture like a time come we're going to save people we're going to go away the other positions do believe in a rescue but the rescue is to come back to the new heavens and the new earth and that's another important phrase. The intent. So, so let me ask you a question really quick. So in this position, then those verses in Matthew, um, which do you have the references for that? Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, because I think that this is my brain um, that is very steeped in the left behind movies. Yes. Right. So when I read Matthew chapter 24, I immediately think, the one taken away is the saved one. Yeah. So let me position. Okay. Keep going. No, I'm going to gonna... tackle that. So let's go ahead and tackle that now. And then let me, just, I'm going to speed through this. I'm going to tackle that. And then we'll set up uh, our next, uh, our next teaching. Um, so the idea for the millennial position is that the issue is not, and let's lead into your point, Lise, the issue is not we're leaving <laughs> earth and going away that issue is actually no there's a new heaven new earth jesus is coming back to inaugurate the new heavens that's where that term i used earlier comes from here's the strong point um this position is held by the earth by the later church fathers we're talking guys like uh, origin augustine uh who's one of my favorites thomas aquinas martin luther john calvin so that's kind of the the camp um the challenges I, i'm going to be fair now the challenges of the amillennial position Revelation 19 and 20 in the premillennial position seem to be sequential. Well, for the amillennialists, they're actually going to say that 19 and 20 are the same thing from different perspectives. So we have to have a very clear interpretive decision on how we can defend that position. The amillennials are going to have to. Um, symbolic interpretation seems confusing. You just kind of talked about it. How do we know when to describe some things literal, some things symbolic? And then here's the other big one. What about 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, where people are caught up in the air with Jesus? Doesn't that point to a rapture? It seems like it does. I'm going to deal with Matthew 24, and then if we have time, the 1 Thessalonians. But let me just first tease out um, this idea of the rapture. The idea of the rapture in general, the way the dispensationalists think, is a going away. Now, one of the most important things when we study scripture is context. 
Um, a text without context, this is a theologian, Ben Witherington says, a text without a context is a pretext. So we can take any text that we want and use it to defend our position, but we have to take it within the context that it's in. So in Matthew 24, verse 36, let me read a couple of verses and then I'm going to unpack it. Uh, but concerning that day, so we're talking about the day when Jesus comes back, but concerning that day, the hour hour no one knows this is super important the hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven nor the son but the father only and then this is interesting this is what jesus says for as were the days of noah put in your mind the days of noah so will be the coming of the son of man for as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage it says until that day noah entered the ark they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away then verse 40 then, notice that word then. In Greek, that is a word that connects the verses before. So we're seeing sequence of thought. Then, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one is left. Therefore, why, why should we care about all this? Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when, uh, on what day, your Lord is coming. All right, so what is happening? The days of Noah. Let me just say this. Uh, Noah is a story of recreation. Noah is a story of the earth being renewed. Remember, God is not destroyed in this point. He wants to recreate the heavens and the earth. So we see the first image of Noah in the recreation. Now, in the days of Noah, what was good? What was good for Noah to stay on the earth or for Noah to leave? Well, for Noah, his staying on the earth is an act of mercy and grace. God saves him and his family. The people who leave, well, that's actually an act of judgment. Uh, and so that's punishment for wickedness. So with that in context, Matthew 24 seems to be clearly taught that the one who stays, it's good for the one to stay. It's the one who leaves because he says, just like in the days of Noah, the one that leaves is the one who is actually um, facing judgment or facing the consequence of their sin. Joel, uh, I'm, I'm really those? thankful that you you helped to see the context of Noah there because I think I've always heard these verses taught. It's the one who's taken away that is the one who's raptured with Jesus, and the one who stays is the one now that goes through this seven year period of. I may accept Jesus, I may not, but the Christians are gone, but some witnesses are left, and so all of that. But but when we put it in context with Noah, again, we're just looking at what the scripture is pointing to. It the ones that were taken away in the story of Noah, those were the ones that were deemed not repentant or wicked. Right. But Noah is the one that was left. And he is the one that he's not without problems. He had problems and issues and all that, but he is the one whose heart was pure to, toward the Lord. Yeah. And so um, I know that when you and I first started talking about this, I was like, wait, this is totally messing with my brain. And so I just want to acknowledge, I know it's probably messing with some of your brains. These are not new things that Joel and I are coming up with to teach today. These are very recognized camps. It is okay if you wrestle with the scriptures. There is no perfect theological camp of thinking here. Yeah. Joel, I, th I love the fact that you've shown here's what they believe and here are some challenges to every single position. But I, I want to just give one more picture with the amillennial position because as I've wrestled through scriptures um, and as Joel and I have studied this quite a bit, I just think it's only fair to let you know, this is where I've landed in this amillennial position. And one thing that's helped me to think of this already but not yet tension, Christ has already risen. And yes, he has conquered sin and death, but he has not yet returned to rule and reign here on earth. The enemy does still have some power, but he's not all powerful. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, as you and I were studying this, this is what helped me. And this is where I want to land today. Think about when we have an election, we're in an election year now, but think about when we have an election, um, all the people come and they vote and then the votes are counted. And this usually happens in November. 
And so we then have a president elect. He has been elected by the people president. So he won the election. The ceremony has not yet taken place. It usually will happen then in January. Um, he's not the acting president at that point. He's the president elect, but he's not in the Oval Office. And so I think this in-between time for the president is a good way for us to think about this in-between time for Jesus. Jesus won. He has conquered sin and death. He is the victor here. But we are living in a time where Jesus has not yet taken the throne here on the new earth. So there is this in-between time that we are referencing. And, and that's where we are right now yeah. in this in-between time. Um, the enemy still is on the earth. He's still active, but he's not all powerful. And I think it's really important, even as we wrestle through the tensions of what we are seeing now, there's a physical reality of what we see. We live on a broken earth that has all kinds of physical dangers and trials and, and just really hard things that we're walking through. At the same time, there's a spiritual reality that we serve a God who is victorious, that is all powerful, and he is working things out in the spiritual that may not always feel good in the physical. But I always want everyone to keep in mind, no matter what camp you land in here, you can walk in the hope and the assurance that we serve a God who has never from beginning to end been a do nothing God. There are periods of silence. Yes. But even in the silence, he was working things out, things that are beyond what our human mind can often conceive or even perceive in our reality but the closer we remind ourselves that the physical reality is not our only reality that there's a spiritual reality happening at the same time the closer those two views in our brain come together the better we will have assurance in our everyday life so no matter what camp you land in whether it's the you know the amillennial position that we're just talking about whether it's the pre-millennial or the post-millennial um, no matter where you land in scripture, I think keeping hope alive in our heart that what will eventually be is very clear in Revelation. And I just want to read you a couple of verses from Revelation 21, because I think this is a good place to land. Um, and don't forget our resource that we have for you in times, what every Christian needs to know. It's in the link below. But this is where I want us to land today in Revelation chapter uh, 21, starting in verse three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse four, he will. This is our assurance. This is where the physical reality of what we see can can be kept in perspective of what absolutely will be. Verse four of Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words, are trustworthy and true. He said to me, verse six, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, so thank you guys so much. I know we have uh, unpacked a lot for you today. I pray that um, this is helpful. Again, don't forget the resource, what every Christian needs to know in times. And all these verses will be there. God bless you. We love you. And go in peace today.